I'm sure almost everyone has an experience of someone from an older generation being racist or something similar. To us, it's really hard to understand how they can't see that the person they're insulting or dismissing is a real person with feelings, with the same inner life that they have, who matters just as much as they do. And we think, like, surely it must be in the back of their mind somewhere, like some indication that maybe this isn't right. Aristotle spent almost all of his life trying to figure out how to be ethical. And it never occurred to him that maybe keeping slaves wasn't a great thing to do. If we look at history, we generally see a trend of an expanding moral circle, giving more and more groups of people consideration, people of different genders, races, nationalities, even species. In ancient Rome, only male Roman citizens had any kind of legal personhood. In the 1800s in France, burning cats alive was a popular form of entertainment. Clearly, there's been some progress since then. But it's very unlikely that our generation is the one that's finally got everything figured out. Who do we need to include in our moral circles? What things are we doing that future generations will look back on in the same way that we look back on racism or slavery? Some things that seem vitally important and obvious to us now, like everyone having a right to vote, would have seemed ridiculous or laughable to people in the past. Other things were so deeply embedded in the fabric of society, it was a lot of effort to change them, like slavery. If we're going to find the things that we're missing, we might need to consider things that feel weird or uncomfortable or kind of silly, or consider radically altering things that just, they're just normal, and you know, it would be a lot of effort to change. I'll give you some examples. We still think it's acceptable to bar people from having a particular job or from entering a particular location based on where they happen to be born, their nationality. Is this really acceptable? And although treatment of companion animals, pets, cats, and dogs, has definitely improved, we still tolerate horrible abuse of animals out of sight on factory farms. How will future generations look back on this? And another idea. What if it's just as important for us to take responsibility to help those we can help, even if they're very far away or in another country, just as much as if they were next door to us? What would that imply for our actions? Once we start considering these sorts of things, it's easy to feel hopeless. There's so much that is wrong. But we live in the richest society that has ever existed. Because of where and when we happen to be born, we have access to an amazing quality of education and technology, sort of communication across the world, thing enabling us to do th things to help people in ways that were never possible before. So there are definitely things that need fixing. And we can actually make a remarkable difference in fixing them. And actually, all the research suggests that helping other people is actually one of the best ways to make ourselves happy as well. Because of the scale of the problems, it's more than one person can fix. We, we can't just sort of leave one thing aside and say we'll come back to it after we've fixed something else. There's, everything is urgent, there's too much to do. This is why we have to prioritize, we have to triage. So how do we figure out what to work on? Once you start looking at this, you find that different ways of helping work enormously better than, than other ways. So this is showing how many years of healthy life $1,000 can get for different ways of treating AIDS. You can see that antiretroviral therapy is about 100 times more effective than treating Kaposi's sarcoma. But 
preventing babies catching HIV from their mothers is about five times as effective again. And this is only half as effective as distributing condoms, which <laughs> is also dwarfed by education for high-risk groups. And all these things are tiny <laughs> in comparison to treating a different disease, treating parasitic infections. So you can see that antiretroviral therapy, which looked so good at the beginning, basically disappeared in comparison to how good these other things are. So even within this narrow area, even within health, that some things are work thousands of times better than others, you can imagine that the difference between com taking completely different approaches could be even bigger. So this, yeah, it's just really, really important to prioritize what you work on. There's a growing movement of people thinking about all these sorts of things. It's called effective altruism. Effective altruism is about asking the question, how can I do the most good? And then doing that. So how do we actually figure that out? Well, a good way is to look for things that are important, tractable, and neglected. Important things have a big impact on large numbers of people. Tractable things are solvable. If we worked on the problem, we'd expect to make progress. And neglected things don't have many other people working on them. So it's likely that there are good ways to help that just no one's tried yet. So some examples. Things like this green bar here, so neglected tropical diseases. Schistosomiasis is a parasitic disease that affects hundreds of millions of people in the developing world. And it's treatable with a simple pill that pharmaceutical companies are literally giving away for free. So the only bottleneck is actually distributing it. This obviously makes it extremely tractable. It's a very simple thing to do. And then it's clearly important because of the large numbers of people it affects. And it's pretty neglected because it's this like weird sounding disease with a long name that people in Western countries don't tend to get, so kind of no one really cares about it, and no one can pronounce it either. Another cause area might be uh, farming. So 56 billion animals are killed for food each year. You might not be sure w whether animals actually matter morally. Say you think maybe that there's like a 10% chance that they can suffer that they matter. Uh, and, and maybe even if they did, they'd only be 1% as important as a human. Some of these sound like not unreasonable values. Then the scale of the problem would be like 56 million humans being like killed every year, being kept in terrible conditions. Like that will be one of the worst crimes in history. And these numbers aren't unreasonable. So that's clearly important. And it's very neglected, even within the area of donations to animals. Although farm animals make up the vast amount of, of animals used by humans, the amount of donations allocated is very small. And it's also relatively tractable to reduce meat consumption, it seems, although the evidence for this is people are currently working on it. It's not clear. So another promising cause area might be thinking about the longer run future. So most decisions are made taking into account the next few years or maybe if we're lucky the next few decades. But this is a tiny, tiny fraction of the f future potential of life. And there are reasons to believe that the things we do now do affect those people. So if we go extinct now, obviously that has this very long run effect all possible future generations are destroyed. And it's an extremely neglected area. Basically, no one represents the interests of future generations. They don't currently have any voice. So what actions can you actually take? Well, donating is an obvious one. So GiveWell is an organization that researches and evaluates charities and can help you find the ones that will do the most good with your money. So one example would be giving to the Schistosomiasis Control Initiative. So the best estimates are something like 
giving 100 pounds results in 45 years of healthy life of someone who would have died or would have had an illness otherwise. So, I mean, what else could you possibly buy with 100 pounds that could be better than that? But actually, you can probably have even more impact with your career. So whether you're working on steering policy or grant making organizations in a better direction or uh, developing new technologies that can solve particular problems or working directly, uh, you know, founding like a new organization that's solving a particular problem, there's many ways to help. And probably this is, this is where you're going to use 80,000 hours of your life in your career. So 80,000 hours, that's why it's called that, um, is an organization that researches the impact different careers have on the world and can help you find how you can use your particular set of skills to improve the world as much as possible. So look for things that we're currently blind to that matter. Do this even if it feels weird or uncomfortable. Prioritize and find the things where you can make the biggest difference. Find things that are important, tractable, and neglected. And if you do this, you're not alone. There's the whole effect of altruism in community. There's a lot of resources like 80,000 hours, like GiveWell, and, and many other things. It's very unlikely that our generation has got it all figured out. But we live in the richest society that, that has ever existed. We have opportunities people have never had before. And if we look back at history, we do find people who we admire, people who pushed outwards the circles of consideration of their time, people like Gandhi, like Nelson Mandela, who, who drew new groups of people into the, the circle of consideration. We can expand our circles. We can fix things and be a generation that future people look back on not with shame, but with pride and gratitude. Thank you.